It's part of the wider Google News initiative. It's a real pleasure to speak with you all today. So thank you for coming on to one of the later sessions of the day. Don't worry, the wine, beer, pizza is all very much in sight now. Um, and I know you've got lots of notes from the conference so far. So hopefully you'll be able to scroll down some extra tools and tips that I'll be able to give you today. Uh, in case you haven't heard of uh, Google News Lab, we are part, as I said, of the Google News Initiative. Uh, the Google News Initiative works side by side with publishers around the world in lots of different ways. Um, but at Google News Lab, we focus on that first section there, advancing the practice of quality journalism. So we are a team of journalists. We're spread out across the globe. Uh, we teach journalists live and um, like in person and uh, online. Uh, how to use a variety of tools for their storytelling. So how they can tell better stories with a range of uh, pieces of technology, essentially. This is our main website. If there's any URL you take from today's session, please do write this down, g.co forward slash news training. This is where you're going to find all of our on-demand courses. This is all in PDF format that you guys can do. Whichever country you guys are in, whichever language you speak, you can do these in your lunchtime, after work. Any of the tools that I talked to you about today, you'll be able to find. So at Google News Lab, essentially we teach, as I said, reporters how to tell stories using a variety of tools. So that can be anything from research tools to verification tools, uh, data visualization, uh, verification, podcasting, video, and so on. So it's a real pleasure to be with you all. And this is what we're going to cover during today's session. So I've picked out some of the tools that I think that will be most relevant to you guys going forward. So perhaps in your day-to-day -day work or in like, long-term investigations. So we're gonna kick off with advanced search. How do we use the Google search bar a bit more effectively? I'm sure you guys are you're using it every day anyway, personally and professionally. Then we're gonna look at Google Earth. So any new updates to Google Earth and how you might wanna use Google Earth as part of your storytelling. Then we'll move on to Pinpoint. Pinpoint is a recent tool from Google, which is uh, absolutely amazing to help you find stories in large amounts of documents and data. And then we're going to move on to Flourish to help you with your data visualization. Okay, so there's lots of different tools here today, uh, a big variety. Uh, please note down any that you think will be useful to you and your colleagues when you go back to the newsroom. And of course, we have our website so you can dive deeper into them when you have some more time. So let's kick off with advanced search. So, you know, Google is if not the best research tool around. We use it every day, don't we, personally, professionally. You guys probably have apps on your phone or on google.com today. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you some tips on how you can use Google in a bit more of an effective way to help you find the stories, the information you need quicker. And the first thing is to start using search operators, okay? So search operators are essentially keywords that you're going to put into your Google search bar in order to narrow down your search. So I've given you some ones here. So we've got my top six. Now there are lots of different search operators, search refinements that you can use. Um, I'm just gonna talk you through these and then it's up to you guys to go off and start exploring them yourself. But these are worth memorizing off by heart, especially in a working newsroom. So the top one there, the minus and plus signs, we can add these into our Google search to essentially remove or make sure we've got keywords in our search. So if I wanted to know more information about a Jaguar, we've got Jaguar the car, we've got Jaguar the cat, the animal, right? So if I put in there Jaguar minus car minus automobile, we're narrowing our search down. So we're only gonna find out information about the cat and then vice versa if you put those pluses in there. Imagine a few years down the line, you're writing a story about vaccination uptake in Italy and you don't want anything to do with coronavirus or COVID in there, you might put in minus COVID, minus coronavirus. Try this at home tonight when you're making dinner, you know, salsa recipe minus onions or whatever. It does work, it's really good. So practice using that. The next one is site. So if you're looking for information from a particular URL. So here we've got bbc.co.uk. If you put a keyword before that, so let's say for example, Boris Johnson, site colon bbc.co.uk, making sure there's no spaces in between the colon and, and what you've written there. You will only get results from that particular website. File type, for those of you who are working with large amounts of documents or are looking for particular files, that could be an Excel spreadsheet, that could be an MP3 file, that could be you know, uh, MP4 file, whatever it might be, PDF, using that file type will enable you to find, in this example here, cricket fixtures with the file type XLS. In URL, clues in the name I guess, so if you have a certain keyword, so I've written journalism scholarship, 
in URL colon apply. That means the word apply will be in the URL of all the results you see. So that one's quite a popular one with journalism students, obviously, because then they're going to get lots of lists of URLs that they can click on to apply for journalism scholarships. In title is in the title of the article that you're going to get as a result. Okay, so if I've put here TikTok, in title how to, that might come in quite useful after some of the sessions we've had today and tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to get lots of different articles about how to do X, Y, and Z on TikTok, for example. And then last but not least, essentially, cache will give you the last saved version of a website. This is really useful if an internet site, you know, let's say a web page um, crashes or it's laggy, or basically you will see the last saved version of that. Google takes a screenshot and you'll be able to see the cached media. Okay, so this works on government websites and your standard URLs as well. So all of these search operators can, of course, be used when you are just generally scouring google.com, you're just using the web. However, we would recommend putting them together. So you can use one, two, three, four. You can use as many search refinements as you like within one search, and that's going to really narrow it down. So rather than you guys in the newsroom, you're working on a breaking news story, you need to find information quickly. The more narrow, the more information that you can give to Google, the better it will be at giving you the results that you're looking for. But if you can't remember them, and you think, what did Caroline say? When you go onto google.com, and you go to the bottom, uh, bottom right, there's this little cog, and you tap on that for settings, and you go to advanced search. So when you tap on advanced search, essentially it's going to give you this magnificent cheat sheet. <laughs> and if you fill in this, essentially you can fill out as many or as little of those tabs as you like. So find pages with certain words or phrases, none of these words, certain languages, regions, etc. you will find a much more refined search. Okay, but those search refinements, I would recommend learning them off by heart because it will save you time. It will also help when you are setting up a Google search alert. Okay, so essentially a Google alert is enabling you to essentially get Google to do the work for you. So if you're going into the newsroom every day or every other week and you're searching for a particular search and you, know, you keep going and doing it, you keep trying to find results, Rather than doing that, save yourself some time, set yourself up a Google search alert. We recommend every journalist, every organization has one of these, or multiple. Google will send you the results of that search directly to your email inbox. So you don't have to actually go onto Google and search yourself. A lot of local newsrooms will do this with the name of their town or, or you know, a particular beat they're covering, because that means if somebody does something newsworthy in another part of the world, they're more likely to get an alert of that, okay? So obviously that could lead to something quite newsworthy. Another search tool that we have here at Google is the Google Dataset Search, okay? So those of you working with data journalism, even those of you working, you know, have never touched data before, but are looking to start finding stories from data, I'm sure a lot of newsrooms uh, that you guys are working in are at least dabbling in using data to, to find and tell stories. The Google Dataset Search is a specific search engine just for that, okay? So it's like a search engine within the wider Google search engine. Um, it was originally targeted scientists and data journalists, but it is open to everyone. So if you go into the Dataset Search, it will look like this. And as you can see here, I've put in COVID-19 UK, and it tells me how many data sets it finds on the left-hand side. And then all of the results I can tap through, and then I can go to the specific URL, which will tell me more information about the license, where I can and can't use it, and then it's up to me to go and uh, visualize that data or to find stories in that data, okay? So if you are looking for data, uh, definitely make use of that data set search. Now, another search tool we have here at Google is Google Trends. Who here has used Google Trends before? Just out of interest. A couple, a few of you, brilliant, fantastic. If you haven't used Google Trends before, bookmark it, go on there every single morning. Essentially, Google Trends is a free website which will help you understand what the world is searching for, okay? And it will tell you what is recently trending in your country. So you can see here, for example, uh, at the top left, I can see that's what's been recently trending here in the UK. I did that this morning. We've got Jimmy Savile, got Ed Sheeran, Everton, and so on and so forth. Depending on the country you're in, you can change this and it will change. What's been recently trending will show you what has jumped in interest over the past 24 hours. Now, of course, that can be great for getting um, context for a story or maybe getting some inspiration for what you want to write about, seeing what your audiences are interested in. 
You can also look at particular uh, terms or topics. So, for example, I've compared two different people, Will Smith and Chris Rock. You can see the search interest over time for those two actors, of course, uh, jumped uh, during the Oscars. Um, but you can see you can compare different terms against each other, which means you can compare people or even subjects. What we also have on Google Trends is blog posts. So the team at Google Trends will pull data from, from Google Trends and it will put together blog posts on bigger stories. So things like coronavirus or elections in your individual countries and so on. So you do have data that you can either just look at, get inspiration from, or you can download this data for later on. So when I talk about data visualization, you'll be able to download this data and put it into our data visualization tool. So we always recommend this is a fantastic tool just to go in in the morning, see what people are interested in, and then leave. And you can also change the country as well, so you can compare and contrast. Another Google search um, tool that we have is Google Images. Now, usually when we search on Google, we're searching for a particular image or we're searching for information. If you have in your newsroom been sent an image by a, you know, a member of your audience or you see a, a, a picture on social media, you might want to search for that image on Google. So you can upload that image or you can paste the URL in and it will essentially tell you all of the other images that are similar to that image. Now, of course, this can be really useful in helping you to verify any images that you have, because we all know it's so easy nowadays to doctor an image, even doctor a video. You know, this is you know imagery that has been doctored in any way. We don't need to be Photoshop experts at that anymore, do we? We have apps on our phone that are advertised now, you know, in our social media feeds. We've got their former Austrian Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, you can see there on the left, that image behind him of somebody smoking. His PR team's changed it to a safer alpine scene. And here we've got the former uh, leader of Canada's Green Party, Elizabeth May. She's holding a, 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 a non-disposable, a disposable cup, which her team have changed to be a bit more greener and climate conscious. So, you know, little things like that, it's very easy to kind of you know, not notice them. However, if we're using Google Image Reverse Search, we can see if something has been doctored, if there's another image that's similar. Likewise, we can also see if images have been taken out of context. Um, some of you might have remembered this photo because this was an image, you can see there it was tweeted by LM Entertainment. This protester in Hong Kong has returned tear gas with a tennis racket. Now looking at that, you might think, oh, that tennis racket's clearly been photoshopped in, or, you know, that gas canister. However, if we upload that into Google Images, we can see that that is a real image, but it was actually used from Picture of the Year from Reuters in 2016, and it was actually from a demonstration in France, okay? So completely taken out of context, that image. And it happens, of course, a lot. So it is something that we need to think about. We can also use Google Image Reverse Search to see the location of images. So I know some of you are really interested in verifying that images um, you know, that we've spoken about already in this conference. So for example, if I had this image and I didn't know where it was from, in this example here, I could just upload it into Google Images and it will show me um, the index of images that it has, what is similar to that image. So here I can see, okay, I don't know where that is. Okay, it tells me it's Victoria Harbor, it's in Hong Kong, and it's shown me other images that are similar to that. Okay, so obviously that's gonna help you to verify locations of images or where an image might have come from. Okay, so use these search tools as backup tools to have with you at all times. Now, those of you that are looking to go further on the journey of verification, there's also a few plugins that you can get. This is not a Google plugin, but it is uh, one that we would recommend. It's called Revi. Uh, Revi is a reverse image search and essentially allows you to search through multiple different reverse image searches in one go. Okay, so rather than just looking at Google, you can uh, download this plugin, uh, only available on Chrome, and you're gonna right click on an image and you can see it's also gonna show you results from Bing and Tinai and others, okay? So it's gonna save you a little bit of time there. Another search bar we have here at Google, obviously we love a search bar, is the Fact Check Explorer. This is uh, such an amazing tool, even just out of your interest, to go and see what type of myths and disinformation has been shared online. Because essentially, if you sometimes go down a rabbit hole and you think, oh, I'm gonna investigate, you know, let's say your great aunt Sally has shared something on Facebook and you think, oh, that doesn't sound right. Or a politician has said something and you think, I just wanna fact check that. Sometimes, you know, journalists can say, right, I'm gonna go investigate that and they're gonna spend hours, maybe even days doing it. 
However, if you go to the Fact Check Explorer, this is a search bar where you can search for a topic or a person and it will give you the results for fact checks that have already been done by other journalists and it will show you whether that claim has been proven to be true, uh, misleading, false, uh, partly true. So I'll show you what that looks like here. So you can see here I've put in the topic as climate change. So I'm going to get lots of different articles that have been debunked facts about climate change, for example, here. So you can see here I can change the language as well to uh, English or all around the world. I can filter those results by keywords or by organization. And the publisher will rate it, whether it's true, false, misleading. And user journalists will be able to tap on that URL and you'll be able to open up the article that tells you whether you know, it's true, false, or misleading, and why, Okay, most importantly. Okay, so you're going to get that extra information. So once that link is clicked, as you can see here, you're going to be taken to that extra article, and you're going to be given that information. Okay, So this should be somewhere that you're going to go straight away before you even start to verify information, because it t takes a matter of minutes and could save you a long time. Those of you that are further um, invested in verification, um, also make sure you check out Bellingcat's online investigation toolkit. I've put the bit.ly link at the top of the screen there so that you guys can write it down and go to it afterwards. It's um, an extensive lift, list of tools that you can use, verifying information on social media, images, videos, audio. And you can see here that you know, the landscape is huge um, and it's definitely worth exploring. And likewise, another resource that I wanted to put in there is the First Draft Basic Toolkit. First Draft have some amazing resources on its website that you guys can use, and you can get stuck into um, learning more about verification, whether that is through Google or through other open source tools that you can use as well. This here is an investigation called Anatomy of a Killing. Can I just see a raise of hands who might have seen this? Yeah, brilliant, a few of you. If you haven't, please go and watch it. It's a fantastic example of how you can use verification tools, um, not just by themselves, but also mixing a range of verification tools together to debunk a particular video. So here we have a video. Um, there was women and children that were killed. Uh, it happened in Cameroon, and the government said this didn't take place in this country. Actually, this is fake news. It happened in Mali. And what the team at BBC Africa did, uh, based in London and, of course, overseas in Africa, they looked at this video, they, sl they slow-motioned it, they looked at every frame, frame by frame, and they were able to determine through a range of different tools, including uh, the Google Earth tools, who the people were, the exact spot it must have taken place at, the date range this video would have taken place at, and it led to the arrest of these men. So just worth uh, going to watch. It's 10 minutes long and great for a, a lunchtime watch with your team. OK, so for the next section of today's course, I'm going to be talking to you about Google Earth. Who here uses Google Earth? A few of you, yeah. I think uh, Google Earth is one of those tools where, you know, when you, you start learning at a school or co college and you always drag that yellow man, you go anywhere in the world and you always go back to your school or your college or your house, right? Uh, but Google Earth is a fantastic storytelling tool as well. So we want to encourage you to use that. Not only can you verify your images within this, of course, by exploring all of the imagery that we have here at Google Earth, but now we have um, interactive projects that you guys can start using and start creating your own projects within. Now, we're able to do that, and I'll talk you through that in a second, but we're able to do that through the use of all of our 3D mapping. So we've got an extensive amount of 3D imagery now within Google Earth, so much so that you might start to think of yourself as a drone, you know, flying over the Earth, looking at buildings, looking at landmarks from different perspectives, different angles. No longer is this a 2D map where it's all flattened. Now it's absolutely amazing what you can do. So I've just made a little GIF there. You know, I can search for Hotel Brafani. As you can see here, it's going to take me all the way down. And I can use my mouse. I can look at the building from different angles. You can also do that, you know, if a crime has taken place somewhere, you're doing a story on it. Or a marathon is taking place in your local area. Or, you know, it could be, uh, you're doing a feature on the 10 best places to go to X, Y, Z, whatever it might be. You can use this tool to really hone in on footage that you might not have been able to get within your newsrooms, okay? So this is being able to help you to get that satellite imagery. Now, as I said, Google Earth also has this interactive features that you can start using. Uh, this is one of the newer developments of Google Earth. 
This is an example of an interactive project created by Time. Um, it was the story of a family of Syrian refugees. As they had a child, they traveled through Europe. But you can see something like this is a little bit more interactive, takes audiences on more of a journey than would be, for example, a long-form article. So you can see here, we can see the family traveling. We can add text, add context, whether that's quotes, whether that's our you know, own writing. We can add any pictures that we like. Now, this was actually produced before the interactive features it took place within Google Earth. Now, you don't need to know how to code. You don't need to know anything about HTML and all that to know how to start your own interactive project. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. When you're in Google Earth, you can see you can create a new project. So uh, creating a new project is as simple as just tapping on that create new project icon and essentially plugging in different locations of where you want to take your audience. You can decide on the angle that they look at a building. You can decide whether it's street view, satellite imagery, take them to 3D locations, 2D. You can change any of the text that's there and any of the pictures. So this can be linked to within your article and take them out into Google Earth to give them more of a view. We also have time-lapse imagery now available in Google Earth. Uh, it's a little bit like time travel. It's absolutely uh, amazing. So now there's 20 million different satellite photos from the past 37 years have now been released within Google Earth, which means that you guys as reporters now have access to time-lapse uh, videos, all on like climate change, urbanization, deforestation, which are all free and available for you to use within your projects. So that is the um, link on there, g.co forward slash time-lapse videos. You can filter these down by location or subject, or if you wanted to, you could just watch them within Google Earth, okay? So there's a lot of different material that you can access at the moment within Google Earth and definitely worth investigating. So all of this is available to you. Okay, the next tool I want to talk to you about today is to take your geolocation heads off. We're gonna go to Pinpoint, okay? Pinpoint is um, an amazing tool that you will be able to use within half an hour of leaving today's session. Um, essentially, it's a research tool, and it's designed for journalists who are going to be working with a large collection of documents. So perhaps you've done a freedom of information request, and hopefully you've, you've received a lot of documents and data. So you could you know, work with um, five documents. You could work with 100 documents. You could even work with 200,000 documents in one go using this tool. Now, if you're not working with you know, a large amount of documents at the moment, of course, you've all written a lot of stories. You've written, you know, you've recorded a lot of interviews. You've got a lot of content that you need to sort and organize. Now, Pinpoint is useful to different journalists in different ways. So we're going to dive into the tool, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. But first of all, I just want to note, you can find it within our, our Google Journalist Studio. So rather than write down loads of different URLs, the Google Journalist Studio is a great place where you can just jump into, and it will link to all the tools that we feel will be most useful to you moving forward as reporters, OK? So our news training site at the beginning of, of today's session, that is where you're going to learn, and this is where you're going to go to have easy access to the tools, OK? So you can see there at the bottom, there's Pinpoint. Honestly, guys, you should all get a Pinpoint account straight after this session. You can search through thousands of documents in one go, OK? So just easily search through them. And the reason why is it uses machine learning technology and artificial intelligence to scan all your documents without you even having read anything for places, for names, and for organizations. And it will automatically pull those out of the documents. It can also read handwriting. And bonus, it can transcribe your audio, OK? So these are the file types that are currently supported. You can access um, any of them just by uploading from your Google Drive, or you can just upload them from your computer directly. And you can see it's going to pull out the people, the organizations, and the locations, which will going to help you to find stories in large collections of documents, Okay, to find links between the documents. All of your collections, which is essentially a fancy name for a folder, right? So you've got like a folder, a collection of all your documents. You can share that with another member of your newsroom, but you don't have to, okay? So your collections are completely private. If you share it with anyone else, they don't have access to delete or add anything to that collection, okay? So everything is kept completely within your password protect protected account. 
And this is what it's going to look like when you open up the tool. So you can see you have a workspace. So your workspace at the top there is where you have your own collections, okay, your own folders. So you might have a collection for uh, Zoom interviews you've done. You might have a, co a collection for articles you've written for a specific magazine or newspaper. You might have a collection for a particular story that you're working on or, or investigation. It's up to you how you want to devise it. You'll also see collections which have been shared with you by other members of your team. At the bottom there, we also have large amounts of collections that you can access and either you know, find stories in, or a, a lot of journalists have told me they're using these collections of documents to essentially practice using the tool, okay? So if you are finding yourself without any documents to play with, you can play with those at the bottom there. But you can see there's a wide amount of documents that you can start uh, playing with within these collections, up to 200,000. So here we've jumped into that NASA documents folder. And you can see it's going to show your documents on the left-hand side. You'll notice that they're all red. We've all got that red PDF sign on. Okay, So everything's automatically been converted to a PDF file. And this allows the tool to filter the collection, Okay, so by, as I said, by person, by organization, or location. So we can see here on screen Neil Armstrong there. He's in 100 of the documents. We can see NASA is in 247 of the documents. So as I click on the filters, what's going to happen is that my, my list is now going to be filtered down. So I've added those three filters on, and now my list of 1,309 documents has gone down to 32. Okay, so it's a really great way to whittle that down. So if you can find stories with links between this, of course, if you add your own documents in there, you can search for names. If you've named anything, if you've got text in the documents itself, you can search through. You can also add your own tags onto these documents as well that you can filter through. Um, so making it as easy as possible for you to find information as quick, as quick as you can. You can also search with keywords, of course. So we're all used to doing that anyway. So you can see in this collection here, I've searched for the word moon. And you can see I've got 350 documents with the word moon. Uh, it will also give you the synonyms. So you might have seen on there, We've got 350 documents, but also the word Luna has been pulled out. Because sometimes if we're working with documents that don't, we don't necessarily know what we're looking for, you know, we're looking for themes, we're looking for a story, you know, it also pulls out the synonyms of that word to help you out. But if you don't want those, you can use your search refinements, those search operators we just spoke about at the beginning, so I can put in there minus Luna, so now I'm not going to get the synonym of Luna, yeah? So it's fairly easy to use, as you can see. I taught this a few months ago, and a gentleman in the audience had already uploaded a thousand documents during me talking about it, and was already using the tool. So, if you've got, um, you know, a hard drive or a computer with you, you know, while you're in Perugia, just have a go with this tool, okay? Because it's so so easy to use. And as I said, it will automatically transcribe your audio as well. So, if you upload an MP3 file into Pinpoint, it will transcribe your Zoom call. It will transcribe the audio from that video package you put together. You will have to rip the audio off a video at the moment, but uh, as, I can, as you see, it's great for voiceovers, great for doing your Zoom interviews, handheld mic interviews, and things like this, okay? So what you'll also notice is that the audio is embedded within that document. So you know how usually when we transcribe something, it's like this really long bar here, and we have to find the exact second. Well, we don't have to do that anymore because essentially the tool will automatically break your audio up for you. So you can just jump to the right paragraph, okay, that has, you know, the, the audio in that you want to listen to again and again. I also mentioned that we'll pull text from videos, so, um, from photos. So you can see here, this is OCR technology. It stands for optical character recognition. So if you have a piece of text within a photograph, so you can see here it says STDN, Mission Manager on the bottom. So you can see here, if I search for the word STDN, it's highlighted it in green, and it's pulled that out from an image. Okay, so if you had um, maybe images that you were looking to verify, this could be useful. If you're looking for a particular image or particular information within a pack of images, also using this feature is fantastic. It will also pull out handwriting, okay, from any handwritten notes you have. Handwritten notes that you've, you've gathered, maybe yourselves, you've done an interview, you've gone to a conference and you've done some scribbles on the bottom of a page. You can see here that the word state has been pulled out, and state is 45 degrees. 
It's, hand, it's handwritten, it's pretty messy. I can't even read that with my own eyes, but the tool's been able to pull it out. So again, um, it's, it's just brilliant in being able to pull out the, the, the information that you need from the right document. I'm just gonna play this video now. Uh, this is by a reporter from USA Today um, of how she was able to use Pinpoint in her investigations. The biggest challenge for reporting honestly is time, right? It's really difficult to say no when somebody wants you to look into something that you believe is important, but you just don't have the time to do it. My colleague Tricia Nadolny and I were asked to handle investigations relating to social services during the pandemic. Our focus really became largely about nursing homes during that time period. We requested records from all 50 states and I uploaded them into Pinpoint. Pretty much immediately when you upload documents and that side populates with the list of names that are included or places that are included, you can kind of very quickly get an idea of what is in there. We compiled that into a database that we then analyzed and provided to the public. For the first time, some families were able to look up their loved one's assisted living facility and see whether there had been a case because in some states and in some counties, facilities were not communicating directly with families in a way where they felt like they understood what was going on. In terms of investigative journalism, our job is to expose wrongdoing, to shed light on something that's going wrong in the hopes that maybe it can go in a better direction. So you can see there it can work really well in terms of long form investigative project, pro projects, but also you know you might be looking at this today thinking I'm going to use this to transcribe all of my audio, or I'm going to use this to essentially archive all of my newspaper's you know, work for the past 10 years, and then I can jump to any article I want just by the tap of a button, okay? So Pinpoint, as I say, completely free tool, access it via the Google Journalist Studio. Okay, the last tool I'm gonna to tell you about today is called Flourish. Um, Flourish is a tool that will enable you to create beautiful animations without any knowledge of knowing how to code. You don't even have had to have a history working with data journalism or animations, okay? Um, this tool itself, uh, as I say, it's completely free to, for you to use. Uh, we do upgrade your accounts uh, when you're from working newsrooms as well, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, but essentially, you can choose from a variety of different templates and pick the animation that's gonna work for you, embed it on your website, screen record it for a TikTok video, or whatever you wanna do with it. So I'm just gonna play you a quick video about what Flourish is, and then I'll show you some of the templates inside. Everyone loves a beautiful data graphic or interactive story, whether it's a map that squishes to make a complex subject simple, a chart that animates to explain a correlation changing over time, or an interactive so rich it can give us a new view of the world. But good data work is hugely time consuming, out of reach for small newsrooms and hard to justify even for the big ones. Until now, Flourish is a new platform that allows anyone to make world-class graphics, maps and interactives quickly and easily. There's no software to install, just log in, click to create a new visualization and choose a suitable template. You can use the ever-growing library of built-in templates, or if you do have in-house coders, adapt the templates or make your own from scratch, allowing you to create a suite of unique data tools that all your staff can use. There's literally no limit to what a template can be. It could be anything from a simple line chart to a rich graphic such as this one for exploring a group of people and how that group changes over time. It could even be something in VR. Making a graphic from a template is easy. Give your project a name and then quickly upload your own data, either by pasting it in from Excel or uploading a CSV file. You can also preview your project on different device sizes. Flourish is fully responsive and mobile friendly. When you're happy with your graphic, you can publish it with one click and grab an embed code, or download the project if you prefer to publish from your own server. But that's only the start. You can now use the unique Flourish Story Editor to guide an audience through your graphic or multiple graphics, assembling different views into a linear story to engage an audience. 
The result can be a step-by-step -step explainer or a graphic that updates when you scroll through a text story or press play on a voiceover. Suddenly, this kind of high-end data storytelling can take minutes rather than days or weeks. But Flourish isn't limited to data graphics. The BBC created a template for making interactive documentaries. It allows the editors there to explain a complex topic, offer up relevant content such as video, and to curate the audience feedback and response on social media. All of this in multiple languages. So that's Flourish. We think it has the potential to be hugely useful in all sizes of newsrooms, and we can't wait to see what you do with it. Okay, so as I mentioned, Flourish is completely free for you to use, whether you want to use it individually or you want you know, to use it as part of a team at work. So essentially, when you have a Flourish account, you can choose a template. So a template has already got data imported into it. All you have to do is change the data, or you just import your own data from a CSV file, an Excel, an Excel sheet, and so on. So every single template on here, you might think, oh, I have no idea what that one does, or why would I use that? It has a blog post that is corresponding, so you can see why you would use a template, how to upload the data, the right form for the data, and so on. So we've got line, bar, and pie charts, as you can see there. We've also got projection maps. These are all interactive, by the way, so your audience can hover over certain regions, certain segments, finding out more information. Uh, we've got some scatter graphs there at the bottom, which you might be familiar with. We've also got 3D maps and hierarchy graphs. You can see there's a range of different templates. It's up to you to choose which one is going to fit the story that you're telling. So at the top left there, you've got a line chart race. Let's say, for example, you have downloaded data from Google Trends, as we saw earlier, and you are comparing search interest over time for two different politicians, let's say. You might want to download that data and then import it into Flourish and create maybe a simple line chart race, for example. Okay, so using these tools in conjunction with each other can also be really useful. Okay, we've got some cards there. They're great for feature storytelling as well. Heat maps. Radar charts, and so on. Okay, so the list keeps going. A lot of people like to go to those photo sliders because they're the easiest to use. You just, you just upload two photos and a before and after, and you're kind of done. But all of these can be embedded directly into the back end of your website. And if you get really creative with it, as I mentioned, you might want to do, uh, you can't export as an MP4 uh, of this at the moment, but you can do a screen record, let's say, import that into your favorite video editing software, maybe use that as green screen for a TikTok video, you know, a weather report, a, a tweet, whatever you're going to do with it, okay? So really, really great tool to have, um, not just in your back pocket, but also to integrate it into the team to create those animations. And there's even a few more there. You can see they're not all based on large data sets. Um, some of them are countdowns, some um, quizzes, uh, feature cards, and things like that, okay? So you do not have to be a data whiz to use this tool at all. In fact, it is designed for people that are not data whizzes so that we can all start to create more visualizations. And that means that newsrooms that do not have the budget or potentially the staff or the skills to do this, now we can all do it, okay? And all of this, uh, we've got like uh, lessons on individual uh, templates on uh, the Kiln, um, Kiln Make Flourish, so on their uh, YouTube channel, which I'll be able to give you the details for as well. Some examples here, the New Zealand Herald. You can see they've uh, covered climate change, what species are going to be most affected by the warming planet. So you can see they've made just a really, really simple feature card. The audience is going to hover over an individual picture. And then we're going to see more about that species. Uh, Lab 24 here, um, I've used this because, of course, we're in Italy, and we can see here um, information about coronavirus, the spread of coronavirus over the past, and you can see uh, the vaccination rates, uh, hospitalized people who were vaccinated and unvaccinated, so you can see these charts can really help us to visualize a story much easier than it might be with text, okay? So just grabbing those audiences members that get drawn to that movement, to those images. Uh, here we've got an example from the Irish Times. So the Irish Times have shown party election results through the years from 1923 to 2020. And of course, something like this, a bar chart race, is quite exciting to watch. I've seen quite a few of these done, even on, you know, things like how many people have died of a certain disease or, you know, crime rates in a certain place, election results, okay? So you can get really creative with the type of story you're telling with these templates. 
And another example here from Euronews. So they've used uh, donut charts to essentially compare the percentage of populations that have been vaccinated with COVID-19. So as an audience member, you can go onto their website and you can hover your mouse over and you can compare and contrast, okay? So things like this, just adding a little bit of animation in the middle of your article doesn't take long. Once you master a template, you can just whiz through. Okay, I would suggest in your newsroom, if you choose to use Flourish, uh, maybe pick a template each and then you can switch skills essentially. So one person learns one template, one person learns the other, and then you know, you're gonna spend a bit of time with each other to swap, to swap those over. So uh, working journalists and newsrooms have Flourish for Newsroom access. Essentially, your accounts get upgraded um, to the, the business account here. So um, if you have newsroom access, essentially it means that all of your creations are kept private within your account. Um, anyone that uses a free account, so the general public, they have to publish all of their um, animations before they get an embed code, whereas uh, journalists at working newsrooms uh, won't have to when you apply for newsroom access, okay? So you can do that if you just type in Flourish for Newsrooms into a Google search bar, you'll get access. Only one person from your newsroom has to do it, and they can apply for everyone for access for the, for the team. You also get a few other options here, so you can see um, down there when it says publish embed update, let's say you are doing a, um, an interactive graphic to do with an election, and the election results are coming in right now, and you know, you've already embedded your chart on your website, you could have somebody in the back end changing the stats and it will automatically change on the front end, okay? So you have to keep going, go back and embedding and so on, okay? And other things like this, you can also update your charts automatically. Uh, you have different export settings as well. This will be available to you all when you clarify for the uh, newsroom access, okay? Which is courtesy of Google News Lab. So, just a reminder from today's session, I know that's a lot of tools that we've run through. If there is a certain tool that you like, whether it's the data set search, Google Earth, the advanced search filters, whatever it might be, our website has specific lessons in PDF form on all of them, okay? So you might be here today representing your newsroom by yourself, or you might you know, have, new, have journalists back home that you might think, actually, I want us all to learn how to use this tool and get really good at it. This is the website to go to, okay? We also provide free training through the Google News Lab. Um, so the session we've done today, we provide that for newsrooms around the world. And as I say, we have different teaching fellows speaking lots of different languages, okay? So um, my area is the UK and Ireland, but we also, of course, have, have uh, different languages that we can, we can train in. So please do get in touch if that's something that your team is interested in. If you have your computer or phone on you, I would ask you, please, if you could just go to menti.com and type in that code. It just gives us a bit of feedback of what tools and the training is important to you. And in a second, when you've scanned that, brilliant. Uh, this is our contact um, uh, emails addresses. So if you have a question about today, I'm Caroline Scott at google.com. If you've got any questions about the tool, uh, newslab support at google.com, uh, we will get back to you on that as well, okay? So, and of course, if you want any training, you can just message us directly, okay? So there's our contact details. Okay, I'm unable to take questions, but come and find me afterwards. I wore bright pink for a reason, so you can find me in a crowded room. So if you have any questions, please come and find me. And um, for those of you that are around tomorrow at 2 p.m., we've got another session. Um, I'm running another session purely on a video creation, podcasting tools, so things about new formats that we can explore with you as well at Google. Okay, thank you.